And tonight I have Ben and Josh on the line with me, and we are going to be reviewing Stormfront, the first book of the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. What's up, guys? Hey, how's it going, Stephen? Hey, Stephen. Nice to be with you again. Hey, so I started reading Dresden Files back in 2015, and since the time that I started, there haven't been any new books published. So I read them straight through when I first started reading them and love them, but it's been five years now. And I'm excited for Book 16, Peace Talks, to come out in July of 2020, so in just a few months here. Josh, I think you're kind of in the same boat, right? Yeah, so I had a very similar experience to you because it was because of you that I started reading them. I think you were, I don't know if you were even finished with the series when you recommended it to me. And I was, I picked it up and read it over the course of the summer. And you assured me um, that he had books coming out regularly. So I was excited. And but up until that point, he that was true, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he had like 15 books in 15 years or something. It was like once a year he was coming out with a book. Yeah, Stormfront came out in 2000, so do the math there, and it's about one a year. Yeah, so I had a similar experience with Name of the Wind. You got me reading that, and then it was right before Wise Man's Fear came out, and we were excited because the trilogy was going to be finished, and no dice on that either. Yeah, and same with the Scott Lynch books, the Lock Lamora books. And I, I guess at this point, the only author we can trust to regular, regularly release books is Sanderson, right? I think that's the only author that we can, yeah, trust to regularly do it. And I should point out that if we were on Twitter, I would be sharing the, the comic where it shows Sanderson and planting a writing shard in, in these different authors for, for writing speed. But unfortunately, yeah. you're not on Twitter right now. When you mean shard, do you mean like a hemallergic spike? Right, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah let, let's be consistent with cosmere related magic okay Come on, that's fair last podcast we did was malazan and i don't know if you could get two different books that are still considered broadly to be in the same genre as stormfront and gardens of the moon yeah for sure completely different like this is just takes takes place over the course of a weekend from the viewpoint of one character i mean it's just super super quick super fun there's no real, no real depth or complexity. There might be some, but it's all pretty surface level. You'll get more as you get more into the series. Okay. Okay. I promise you that. Yeah. So I, I should point out that <clears throat> this is my first time reading. So this has been, it's my first time reading. And I'm sitting here with Josh and Steven who've read the whole series. Experts, experts happy to weigh in. And I think that the plan, he said that there might be upwards of 20 books. Is that right, Steven? Yeah, I've heard that. And if you look on his website, it actually says like 23 to 24. Ooh. So it, it's hard to say. And he's writing this other steampunk series right now that I don't think has been super popular. So I'm just kind of hoping he bags that and goes back to Dresden Files. Ha, has he had, because are you talking about Windless? Uh, Air, Aeronauts Windless, yeah. Has the second book came out? Because I read the first one and enjoyed it. Oh, you did? I haven't read it. So maybe that's a better review than the one I just gave. But, uh, <laughs> No, I, I think the second one is supposed to come out soon. It's called The Olympian Affair. Okay. All right. I'll keep my eye on that. Somehow I just know random tidbits of knowledge like that. <laughs> if you guys want us to cover that, then hop on uh, Discord or tweet at us and all we'll, we can put together a review of that as well. And actually, when I was younger, I read his other, his other fantasy series called The Codex of Lyra. That's more of your typical fantasy setting and quite enjoyed that. I do think his urban fantasy Dresden Files is by far the, the best writing he has. Okay, so before we get into spoilers, let's hit on a couple more things. So first of all, this is an urban fantasy, right? It takes place in Chicago, but there's a supernatural element to it. It's almost like an adult's Harry Potter to some degree. I mean, Harry and Harry, both are wizards, right? Sure. Yeah. One's a detective, one's a magician. He becomes an horror. Spoilers for Harry Potter. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, if, if Harry Potter were to grow up, become an or, become disgraced, and move to America. That's, <laughs> That's Harry, Harry, Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden, if I have his full name right. And it's told in first person, almost like a diary entry. And yep. it's uh, very fast paced. The books are short, um, maybe 400 pages, if that. Actually, no. So Ben and I were just going over this. The first book is only about 200 by the oh, time you wow. get up to book 15, they get up to about 450, but they're still fairly short compared to other epic fantasy. Yeah. 
they're, I wouldn't even compare them. They're not epic fantasy. They're urban fantasy, short, fun reads. It's more like you're watching a movie than anything else, I would say, in terms yeah. of the plot complexity, what happens, the pacing, stuff like that. It's like you just sit down and watch a movie for a book. And we should probably mention that there is a Dresden Files TV show, if you are interested. I watched yeah, I the first two I think it's way, that. you have seen it? I heard it was way bad. I, I wouldn't say it's way bad. I mean. It, I, I it was, watched it as well. It yeah. came out in 2007. It's like, it's not bad. Okay, should I give it a watch? What network is it on? It's on, right now, I saw, I watched it on Prime Video today. Hmm. I think it, it has some, it has ads in it though. So it's like on Prime with ads. Oh, no, not ads. But I don't they're think not bad do. ads. They're like one in the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end or something. Oh, That's I thought it. you were going to say the ads are entertaining. <laughs> no, there's a lot of presidential ads right now, and those are not entertaining. Okay. Okay. We, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. That that's not the point of this podcast. <laughs> All right. I would say if you're in the mood for some quick fun, probably the best urban fantasy I've read. I've I I always go back and try and find a series that's going to fill my uh, my Harry Dresden itch, and I always walk away disappointed whenever I try and read other other urban fantasy. Have you actually read any other urban fantasy? Yeah. I mean, every now and again, I go on. Um, I go on like the library and I try and find a good urban fantasy. Like I go read some lists of the best urban fantasy and try and pick something from the top 10 that I see consistently. On. And I don't want to throw any series under the bus right now, but I just am never that entertained and always just <laughs> wish it were Dresden. The only other urban fantasies that I've, I don't think I've even read another urban fantasy, but when I go to look at them, they're always kind of corny premises and, uh, more often than, than not, they have some kind of sexy woman on the cover. And to, to be fair, them. this is a corny premise as well. A wizard in Chicago as a private detective, like that's kind of a corny. Yes. Uh, so, so what is it about? And we can still keep this non-spoiler. What is it about this series that makes it okay? Because, like, I, I think we'd all agree it is fairly corny. I, I would just say it doesn't take itself too seriously. You know, it, it just it's just a fun ride, and it's just like in your face kind of about it and it's not uh, yeah it just doesn't take itself too seriously i'd say what do you think ben you just finished yeah you know i think that this is like it's almost like a buddy cop book you know that it's all going to be resolved in the end and it's going to be end up pretty much okay like it's just you kind of have that feeling all throughout it you're like okay this is just going to work out for dresden you know and so it's almost like comfort food only in book form yeah I'll, I'll give you that i think through the first what four or five they're pretty much one-off adventures and then he does start to tie in some of the plot elements back in so you're going to see some of the things you see in book one become more important later on but for the most part they things do kind of tend to follow that same type yeah. of feel everything works out most of the eight plots of the book are resolved in each one, i'd say yeah, it's almost like Harry Potter where each book has a, a new thing that comes and it's important for that book and then maybe it's not as important later on in the series. Okay, so if you're in the mood for a thrill ride, urban fantasy, fun, fast-paced, kind of goofy uh, wizard, then pick it up, give it a read, and I think you'll know after book one if you like it or not. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't know. I think maybe you need to read... If you like book one, you'll like the rest. If you didn't like book one, I feel like there's still a chance you might like the series later on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because our, our other podcaster, Jake, has read the first few, and he didn't like them as much. I don't want to put words into his mouth, but we did keep trying to get him to keep reading because the, the larger plot is very intriguing. Jake, if you're listening, keep on reading. <laughs> okay. So I guess before we get into spoilers, um, we should do our customary content review. So language, there was one F word, I think, in the whole book. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so there was, there, sure was, I remember that. there was one F word in this book. And I would say every chapter would have kind of a harder swear, you know, some, some Bs, some As. Some so, Bs with As. I, yeah, some Bs with As. I think that, um, I think so, it's probably PG-13, but it's like border, borderline R. So yeah, you should just be aware of that. You know, there's there's probably one harder swear every chapter. 
But in terms of content, language is probably the lowest rated, like uh, the least severe in terms of the other content categories that we're going to be talking about, right? Really? You think there's more violence in sexual content? Yeah, th- there's definitely violence. It's not um, really explicit. It's more just like magic violence, right? Well, you have uh, the first scene of the book. Let's, we, well, we're, we're trying to keep the spoiler free. Yeah, yeah, but it's literally the first. Okay, he comes to a pretty gruesome crime scene. that, And they do describe it in a good amount of detail. Um, I, I read these books before I had read a lot of Grimdark. And that scene like kind of stuck in my head. That's one of the few scenes I read of the book was him describing walking in to this violent crime scene. I think we're so, fine to describe that because it says in the book blurb, this is some people that have had their hearts ripped out, right? Yeah, yeah. So it talks about, and this dips into the um, sexual content as well, but it talks about how there's this couple that was kind of in the throes of passion and both of them had their um, hearts ripped out of their chest and their uh, rib cages were showing. It, it was It was graphic. Yeah. Now, now I, I wouldn't say it's like grimdark. It's not Joe Abercrombie, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's graphic. Yeah. You might not want to throw it to your 10 year old. They're going to have some nightmares about that. So mm-hmm. I guess, uh, I guess in my youth, I did not remember this. I mean, I, I read them five years ago, but uh, some of those details must have faded. Yeah. And then uh, other sexual content is um, there's talk about like group sex um, it's yeah, never there's, a, really, there's a couple orgies that that happen. Yeah, it's never really on on screen, really, right? Um, there's one part where he kind of busts in on it. Um, yeah, but it's not described, so it's more alluded to. Um, right. There's a lot of illusion. It's nothing extreme, but it is present. Yeah, yeah. So I would say this is a very high PG-13 rating for in terms of all this content. I think you could. Um, you know, like if you watch like CSI or something, then you might see a similar level of gore as is described in this book. Yeah. And that's a really good comparison because it is basically the pilot of some kind of supernatural crime TV show, right? Yeah. So I would, I would definitely say that this is not like a YA book series, but it, it's not like extreme uh, violence or sexual violence. Um, in terms of swears, it has the best. This isn't really a swear, I don't think, but it has the best. It's not really an in-world swear, but Harry's favorite line is Hell's Bells. And I cra- I just laugh every time he says it. That's his catchphrase. <laughs> That's his catchphrase. Okay. All right. So let's let's jump into kind of the meteor parts of this discussion. I'm just going to read a quick summary. And, and then we can talk about some specific things that we liked that we didn't like and kind of, kind of wrap it up. Okay, so Harry Dresden is a Chicago-based wizard who seems to be constantly down on his luck, but always finds a way to win the day. Accompanied by a sassy ghost who lives in a skull and a cast of female sidekicks that he just can't stop awkwardly flirting with, Harry must piece together two seemingly unrelated cases to stop the big bad guy from yanking out more hearts. He, see, he seeks help from forest fairies, vampire pimps, mob bosses, and abused housewives. Harry ultimately takes down the evil dude with the wicked combination of crotch kicks and cleaning spells. He himself is saved by his no-nonsense parole officer. While this mystery is wrapped up, wrapped up right, it's clear that there is another one right around the corner. Yeah, I think that was a great summary. What are some of your, I guess, Ben, you just finished the book. What, what was your favorite scene from the book? Okay. I think that my favorite scene was the climactic scene at the end where he kind of faces down um, with Victor, who we find out is this kind of guy that's um, been dabbling in the dark arts, who um, has managed to get a bunch of power from storms and orgies, a combination of storms and orgies. And so he's able to take some people out by yanking out their hearts, which should be impossible. So anyway, he has this kind of showdown with Victor um, and it takes place in a burning house with with all sorts of interesting things happening. And in the end, he's dangling kind of from a balcony, thinks he's going to die and he is end up being saved by um, his parole officer who's kind of had a feud with the whole book. So I thought that was pretty fitting. My my favorite character interaction, I think, 
that I didn't appreciate the first time I read it was his interactions with um, Macron, Macron, Johnny Marcon, the gentleman, yeah, the gentleman, and just the tension when they're in the same scene together is always very palpable. Like you can tell that they both respect each other and don't really want to get in each other's way, but keep getting forced to in each other's way, keep getting forced in the same scenario. And I think that the setup in book one uh, is done very well for the rest of the series. Yeah. So kind of in that scene, we find out a lot about soul gazing. Do you want to talk about that at all? Cause I think that that was probably one of the more interesting parts of the magic system. Is that the idea where if you open your third eye and you see something, you can never unsee it? The, similar. That was more like if you look into Dresden's eyes, then like he sees into your soul and and you can see into his. Yeah. Right? You, you kind of see each other's essence and that's, kind of, that's imprinted on you as I understand it. Right. So I think when um, him and the mob, mob boss guy that Josh was referring to, they look into each other's souls and he sees kind of this like, he describes it as like a slate of just passionless. He's going to do whatever's most efficient, even if that means killing people. Like he's just this guy with seemingly like no emotional connection to anything outside of what's best for him. Which actually, if I remember correctly, is somewhat undone in later books. <laughs> well, we don't need to spoil later books for people. I'm just trying to say that Marcone is an evolving character and he appears every, I don't know, three or four books. And those always has some nice interactions with Dresden. Okay. Uh, they do bring out the, the aspect of soul gazing. That's what it's referred to in the world, right? Yeah. And they, they talk about how um, the bartender like refuses, like doesn't want to meet Harry's eyes because he doesn't want to accidentally soul gaze with him. And they bring that up a few times. And it is a cool part of the magic system. Yeah, I thought that was one of my one of my favorite parts of the. It was something that like isn't normally talked about with wizardry, I guess. And so I thought it was cool. So let's talk about a little bit more about the magic system. How would you guys rate this on a scale of hard magic system to soft magic? If I remember right, he can do a few spells, and we kind of know what they are, and we know what it takes for him to use them. So I would say it's somewhat hard, but also soft in the sense of there's not a ton of rules around it. And it's more than Gandalf, but not not as hard as any kind of Sanderson-esque magic. So here's where I kind of, I would say it's around the same level as Harry Potter. And I think that's that way because there are very few instances where he's, limited because of the like lack of ability to produce magic i think that the reason why um harder magic systems are more engaging is because there's there's hard limits built into them for example if vin doesn't have any metals on her she can't use magic right if kaladin doesn't have any stormlight he can't use magic and so and i don't really get the sense that that happens too much in well, I think he gets tired, right? He gets hurt, yeah. tired, and and is unable to conjure whatever it takes to do the spells. Sometimes, it's, well, it's more it's more of a depletion. Like you have a little resource bar, is what I think about it, and like you get it gets depleted and depleted. Well, yeah, even though even when he was depleted, he was able to like just summon a bit more energy and go face the bad guy. You know, like yeah, but that's where it gets to. He has to become creative and clever with how he uses magic at the end you know he's like oh let me pull up this little cantrip i know um and that you know that i do on a daily basis but i would never think about to do it in a fight you know so i i think a good comparison is uh the witcher is gerald gerald however you say his name gerald of rivia yeah yeah i think that that's a good comparison where you don't always know the extreme limits of what he can do and he always has to have resources on him you know drink a potion and then he can do a cool spell and that's kind of the same thing with Dresden he has his little set of tools he has his bracelet he has his amulet um he has his little white scarf that uh, holds sunlight you know he has his little trinkets and then he has 
is deaf and just the, the power inside of him that he uses. So I can see both of your points. I see Ben's point because it does seem like sometimes the author has an out in if he can do something or not, because it does sometimes just come down to if Dresden has the heart to summon up the extra mana that he needs to cast the, the winning spell. And I also see Josh's point because there are a lot of times where he's facing off against some heavier hitters than himself and he's able to outsmart them. Yeah. And he does a lot of preparation. You know, he makes potions and he goes and chats with Bob as he brews and he, he, he prepares um, and charges up his energies and stuff like that. And so I think that um, while it's never super, super well defined, it is harder than um, what it would be on appear to be on surface level. Yeah. It's usually not just getting pulled out of nowhere. There is some reason for his magical abilities and what he can and can't do. Okay. That's fair. So, so what about what are your favorite scenes, Stephen? Do you, do you remember anything specifically or has it been too long? Honestly, I don't remember a ton from this book and I did a quick l- a glance through of a summary and it doesn't even seem like there were all of that many scenes in the book. So <laughs> I guess I'll just say in general, I love the, the chats with Bob as he is gearing up and I like some of the quieter moments and just, just the Dresden humor um, gets me quite a bit. There are several big iconic scenes throughout the series that I remember, but honestly, this book was not one of the best entries in the series. So I have a few hot takes that I kind of want to talk about, see if you guys agree. What got me kind of right off the start, um, and maybe this is just because we're in like this Me Too era, but the, the male gaze of this book is startling, right? So if you're not familiar with the concept, male gaze is kind of like, this point of view that kind of sexualizes women and it's kind of if you were to go in the eyes of like a stereotypical red-blooded american man what like he would be thinking about and i feel like dresden is a character that is kind of written that way and that there most of his interactions take place with women that give him an excuse to think about that so you have Monica Sellers who comes to him at the beginning to hire him as a private eye and she's cute in kind of like a suburban way where she's kind of like the stay-at-home housewife, but she has that kind of beauty. You have Lieutenant Karen Murphy, who's kind of this, you know, hardened cop who's, who kind of quirk smiles at, at him at just the right moment to get him. And then you have Susan, the reporter who flirts with him to get the story. You know, like it's just time after time, like these women that, that he just kind of overtly flirts with and checks out throughout the book. So that's my hot take. I did not love that. It almost made me put down the book. That's a pretty common criticism. In fact, if you look at the Tor reread, it's the majority of the comments are going back and forth <laughs> discussing this. Okay, so okay. That's maybe not, not even that, that hot of a take. Okay. I guess he, here's my response. So I don't disagree. I think you are seeing the world through Harry Dresden's eyes a 20-something-year-old red-blooded American male. So I don't think it's completely unreasonable uh, to to see those types of thoughts. I also think that Harry is a fairly good guy. He's more of an old-school chauvinistic, and he's a respecter of women. And I don't he's not taking advantage of women as he's doing this. But I can see how it may be a little startling, especially in the, in the Me Too days to see women depicted more, more objectified. So I'm, I'm kind of back and forth here. It's not the greatest thing. I think I was able to read past it without thinking too much about it in my first read. I don't know. I'm split. What do you think, Josh? Looks like I'm the tiebreaker. Um, it is an issue. It is an issue. It is good to know going into the book that women are objectified. In this book, he does introduce and I don't want to spoil things for later books, but he does introduce like kind of the the main interests that Harry is going to have throughout the series, some of them. And so um, there aren't that many characters that are introduced and a few of them are going to like, that's the relationship flirty relationship he's going to have with them the entire series. And so, but it is a problem with 
the rest of the series. Whenever a character is introduced, they're always you know, talked about. It did not make me want to put down the book. It wasn't a huge deal for me. But if that's going to irk you, then it's going to irk you. And you're not wrong for, for it. And two other things. So it's not like women are necessarily overtly sexualized. There are quite a few men who are sexualized as well in a pretty comparable way. So I don't think it's all one-sided. And I do think there are some strong female characters. Murphy is what in every book, and she continues to be a cool female character that does quite a lot and doesn't always need to be saved. So it's not like every woman is a femme fatale. And later on in the series, there are more. There are some queens of different magical realms that may or not appear that that can do quite a lot and are very powerful. And there are just there's some other characters as well that that are strong. So I, I don't necessarily yeah. think that every so, woman so, is. So I think that's the that's the really interesting thing is that there are several very strong female uh, protagonists and antagonists in this book, in this book series. That doesn't mean that objectifying them is not an issue as well. And yeah. So so look if if you're going to if if you're going to be triggered by um, a pretty constant objectification of women then maybe this isn't the right series for you. So something that I really enjoyed that I wish we had gotten more of was Harry's backstory. And one thing I loved about it was that we were able to find out his backstory without flashbacks. Um, So one pet peeve of mine is when authors take you unnecessarily out of present day and put you into um, kind of a weird flashback just to develop the character. And with this story, it was more like, something triggers Harry to think about really quickly something that happened when he was younger. And we kind of got his backstory through that. And so um, I think what I know about his backstory so far is that somehow he was, um, he was trained by a dark wizard who he ended up killing in self-defense. Right. And that's, that's pretty much all I know after reading the first book. And so I really, I wish that we would have gotten more because that seemed really, really like a cool avenue too. You will get I more. Think, you will I get think, more. Yeah, I think that the one of the best thing that this series does is expanding Harry's backstory and expanding the universe in pretty um, incremental ways every book. You know, like you always are finding out more in not super uh, info dump ways that are really interesting. And not only will you get more of Harry's backstory, you'll get more of everyone's backstory right yeah so if that interests you Ben, if that's what you like then i think you're going to be impressed with the rest of the series let's jump into worst of the best our ongoing segment and i'll start us off if that's okay do it so ben alluded to this epic scene where he's going into this haunted house you know his third eye is triggered he's going through he's seeing all this creepy stuff he's about to confront the main antagonist um It's really setting this uh, very dark, interesting, complex scene. And then he says a line that his coat swirled or blew like Batman's cape. And it did not jive with me. And I know that this is really nitpicky. And I know that part of the charm of the series is that it's just kind of goofy and it throws a whole bunch at you. But that line, it just felt really out of place. And I was just like, that doesn't help the imagery. It doesn't really help the setting of the scene. And it threw me out of the scene. And it just, I didn't love it. So in a book where we have fairies summoned from the Never Never and bribed by pizza, your problem is that his cape swirling like Batman. Like I said, it wasn't just the, it wasn't just that line. Like other parts of that book, when he's walking in to maybe uh, face down Marcone or when he is um, going to summon that fairy, there's a lot of places where that would fit, but I felt like it was just a little bit more serious. And I know that part of this book is that it doesn't take itself too seriously. And I said, that's what I like about the book, but at sometimes you just have to uh, stick with the scene that you're setting. And I didn't feel like that fit in that scene. I, I don't know. It just, threw me out of it that's fair and i think some of the best parts of the series is the writing and how far into it he leans 
that can create some really fun and cool moments. So, but that's fair, Josh, if that took you out of it. So my best of the worst, I don't remember too many details of this book. I'm going to be honest. So I'll just say this book in general was the worst of the best for me in terms of the series being the best part, but this individual book being one of the worst entries. There's not a whole lot of connections between this book and the larger conflicts that really make the series cool. And it's the action is a little disjointed. The writing is a little clunky at times from what I remember. So yeah, episode one of the TV show, if this was a TV show, this would be the first episode, the pilot, and it's not the greatest. So there's mine. My worst of the best. I loved the scene where there's like a demonic thing that was conjured to get Dresden in his house. And I thought that was teed up perfectly because the reporter was there with him and there was like a lot of stakes and it was super exciting. And then what happens? She drinks the stinking love potion. I mean, come on. Like that did not need to happen. It kind of eliminated the enjoyment of the scene for me because suddenly like you have this character that could have been competent and could have helped Harry out and maybe like proved her worth. And instead she drinks a love potion. All she can do is lust after Harry. And it was just like such a weird direction for the scene to take. You're talking about like Harry running around naked because he was getting showered. And it was just like a weird scene for me that had so much potential. So worst of the best right there. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, thanks everyone. We are going to, are are we going to continue reading Dresden Files? I I assume at some point we will continue making our way through in preparation for Peace Talks, right? Yeah, I don't know if we're going to do an episode for every book. Maybe we might combine some books because there's a lot, but I think I, I really enjoyed the series and they're not it's not a big commitment for those of us that have read it before. So I I'm for sure gonna keep on reading this series. It's it's awesome. Okay. Thanks everyone. Listen to us next time. <laughs> <laughs>